Hey everyone, Father Lane here. Welcome to another class on our course on the Pauline Letters. And today we have come to San Francisco, California, a unique ballpark in that it's right next to the San Francisco Bay and McCovey Cove, so baseballs can be hit into the water. It's a most unique ballpark. In the same way, Philemon, our topic for today, is a most unique letter. For starters, there's a bunch of different ways to pronounce Philemon. I once looked it up in four different Bible dictionaries and got four different answers. Philemon, 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 and Philemon. So have your pick. I'm going to say Philemon. It's also a most unique letter in that it's the one letter in the 13-letter Pauline corpus that is written to an individual. It's written to the individual Philemon and the house church that's centered in his home. Moreover, it's the shortest letter of St. Paul. So it's very different in terms of what it's like to read, and we're going to delve into it here in this class. Let's get to our agenda for today. We're going to proceed in a little bit of a different order than we have with Paul's other letters, simply because Philemon is so unique and it's so short. We're going to talk just about the situation, and we're going to infer it from what we see in the text. Then we're going to look at a couple of the different features of the letter. We're going to talk specifically about how Paul uses some word plays to make a larger point. And then we're going to explore a little bit the enduring meaning of this very brief letter. But first, the situation. Let's look at the text. We pick up in verse 10. Again, there are no chapters in Philemon because it's all just one chapter. Philemon, verse 10. I urge you, the you being Philemon, on behalf of my child Onesimus, whose father I have become in my imprisonment, who was once useless to you, but is now useful to both you and me. I am sending him, that is my own heart, back to you. A few things to notice here. First, we can infer the basics of this letter. Paul is in prison. This is the second of our five captivity letters. You'll remember we've already spoken about how Philippians is one of the five captivity letters, likely the first written, Philemon is the second, and we'll talk about Colossians, Ephesians, and 2 Timothy as well a little later on in the course. So Paul is in prison, and he meets Onesimus, who is a former slave of Philemon. We're not quite sure about all that led up to this. Scholars dispute to some extent, but it seems likely that Onesimus is an escaped slave, or at the very least is a slave who's been sent to Paul and doesn't wish to return. You'll notice I've got useless and useful highlighted on your screen here, and I'll explain why in a little bit. Paul is going to send Onesimus back to Philemon, but with much commendation, saying, I am sending him, Onesimus, my own heart, back to you, Philemon. With the point being, Philemon, I expect you to do the right thing. We'll see what he says further, picking up in verse 15. Perhaps this is why he was away from you for a while that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a brother, beloved especially to me, but even more so to you as a man and in the Lord. Again, no longer a slave implies that Onesimus was Philemon's slave and that Paul is sending Onesimus back to him, but not just to be the slave he was before. Paul wants something more from Philemon. So let's talk now a little bit about who the four main characters are in this letter. Paul is in prison, and he's appealing to Philemon to receive Onesimus back, not just as a slave, but as a brother. That word brother is going to be very important in this letter. Philemon is the slave owner and is a prominent Christian who owns a house that's headquarters for one of the house churches here. This is a point of scandal in our post-Civil War American context, that a slave owner would be a key figure in one of the early churches. Indeed, it's all the more surprising because we know how often Paul uses that metaphor of redemption, that metaphor which means that one goes from the status of slavery to freedom. How is it, people ask, that Paul would speak so much about going from spiritual slavery to freedom while tolerating someone who owns literal slaves and does not set them free? It's a question that gets raised. We'll see what Paul has to say about that. Onesimus is the slave in question, and Epaphras is mentioned at the end of the letter. He's also mentioned in Colossians chapter 1, verse 7, and seems to have founded the church at Colossae. So this is all set in Western Asia Minor. We have reason to believe that this is located near Colossae, which is also not far from Ephesus. All of this is in the province of Asia, in, a, in Western Asia Minor. 
We'll see in our next class about the affinity between Philemon and Colossians, but that's for another day. Let's just unpack this a little bit more. Onesimus is a slave, and slavery, we must remember, was ubiquitous in the Roman Empire. While some slaves were debtors who could work off their debt and then be set free, much like indentured servants of the American colonial period, most slaves were chattel. While there was not a racial component to slavery in the Roman Empire, unlike how there was in American slavery, the institution was surprisingly similar. Slaves were property, owners had great liberty in terms of how they treated their slaves, and an escaped slave was liable for severe punishment, including death. There were slave rebellions back in the ancient world, but they were suppressed by the Roman Empire. And indeed, the slave economy was crucial to that of the Roman Empire. So it's not entirely unfair to ask the question of why Paul didn't outwardly oppose the unjust social structures of his time. I think the best answer to that question is that Paul was focused about living for eternal life. It's not that he didn't care about the injustice present in his society, but his principal focus was on something else. He wasn't trying to be a social justice warrior. He certainly did not see himself as a political activist. But for someone like Onesimus, only two paths existed. He had only two avenues for hope in this world. To flee, that is flight from slavery and hope that he could get away as a runaway, or manumission, but even a manumitted slave was still vulnerable. They weren't entirely set free. There was still an expectation that the former slave would be loyal to the owner that set him free. So the history is a little bit tricky there. So what does Paul say to Philemon regarding Onesimus? We need to look here at four plays on words present in the text. The first is the name Onesimus. The word Onesimus means useful. It was a common name in the Roman Empire for a slave. So Onesimus literally is useful, but he's called useless in verse 11a. Apparently Onesimus, for one reason or another, has been useless to Philemon, perhaps because he ran away, perhaps because he was disobedient. We're not entirely sure why, but he had gone from being useless, and Paul says that he may now be useful to you, Philemon. He is useful to you, Philemon, and he has been useful to me, Paul, here in my imprisonment. What's important to notice here, you'll notice in this right-hand column here in the Greek, useless akriston, useful elkriston. Notice how I'm pronouncing those words. It's thought in Greek, as pronounced in that time, that this word, while it's spelled differently, would have been pronounced very similar to the word Christos, anointed Messiah Christ. So there's a play on words here. Onesimus has come to faith. And so Onesimus has gone from being without Christ to being good with Christ. A Christon, El Christon. So he's being sent back as a new person. Let's look now at the enduring meaning of this brief letter. St. Paul says towards the end of the letter, So if you regard me as a partner, welcome him as you would me. And if he has done you any injustice or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, write this in my own hand. I will pay. The word here translated partner, koinonon, means more literally common, a sharer. So Philemon shares with Paul in their common faith. Paul refers to Philemon as a brother. Since Onesimus has come to faith, Paul is telling Philemon, you need to see your former slave as a brother. Indeed, you'll notice that word brother occurs four times in this brief letter, and notice how they're used. In verse 1, unsurprisingly, Paul refers to Timothy, his co-sender, as a brother. We see that in a number of letters. Paul refers to Philemon, his addressee, as brother in verse 7, but in verse 16, he's going to refer to Onesimus as a brother, before in verse 20, again referring to Philemon as a brother. All Christians our brothers and sisters in the Lord. We'll move on in our next class to talking about Colossians, a letter that has a lot in common here with Philemon. Until then, read well and pray well.